Are y'all excited this morning? Has God been good to you this morning? I just want to make sure because sometimes when y'all sitting in the sanctuary, it don't look like God has been good to you. But I know that he has. Sometimes we just have to be reminded how good God has been to us. Sometimes we just have to take a few moments in our day to just think of all the good things that God has done for us and done to us and been with us because we're going, you know, I, I get it. Sometimes we go through seasons to where everything is chaotic and everything is, is, is out of our control and we don't necessarily get to dictate what's happening. But in spite of it all, God has still been good to you. See, because we say, you know, all, all the time we say, we'll come up here and we'll say, God is good. And you'll say what? And then I'll say all the time, God is good. Okay. See, the key to that phrase is all the time, right? He's good all the time. Even when things aren't going your way, he's still good, right? So we still have a reason to rejoice even when things aren't going the way we think they should go, right? All right, at least two of you think that. At least two of you believe that this morning. We're going to go to the scriptures this morning. And I really want you to be patient with me today. And I really want you to hear out what God is saying to you and I today. Today is First Fruit Sunday. And we're going to talk about First Fruits today. Um, and I really want you to be open. I don't see when I said first fruits, half of you already, you know, you kind of sunk down in your seat. I don't want you to do that. But I want you to hear that which God is saying to you today. OK, um, we're going to start in first Kings and it's chapter 17, verse 13. And it says this. And Elijah said unto her, fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Understand something. This is a, a widowed woman who doesn't have anything. And God has sent Elijah. Uh, Elijah has upset Jezebel. And he has, by the power of God, he has destroyed all of her prophets and God is sending Elijah to this place where this widowed woman is going to be there to help him but the thing is this widowed woman doesn't have anything so she doesn't have anything and Elijah is scared to death running for his life he doesn't have anything and so it's two people meeting each other that don't have anything and so Elijah says this woman says Elijah comes to her house and he's hungry. He's just gone through all of this. And he says, I, I, I'm, if you could get me some bread. And she says, look, I don't have very much. What I was about to do is I was about to go make some bread for my son and myself. And then we were going to die because that's all we had left. And then Elijah comes to her and he says this. He says, I hear that's what you were going to do. But before you do that, I need you to make me some bread first. And then after you make me some bread, then you go make your son and yourself some bread. Now, half of y'all in here already said, oh, I know he has lost his mind. See, if that was you and me, too many of us would have already said, no, Elijah, prophet or no prophet, baby, uh, that's my last and I'm not going to give it to you. This was a test for this woman's faith. Her faith was being tested. It was her last. My question to you is, would you be willing to obey God even if it was uncomfortable? See, are you willing to be obedient to what God says for you in your life even if it's uncomfortable for you? See, because the attitude in today's society for you and I is, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. It's mine, and I'm not giving what's mine away. It's mine. That's the way that we live our life. Most people, even Christians, even Christians, spend our life focused on what we can get 
versus what God is asking us to do to be obedient to him. We're more concerned about what we don't have and what we can get instead of being obedient to what God wants us to do. Most of us give God, listen to me, most of us, <laughs> I didn't say all, so don't be mad at me. Most of us only give God our leftover time, our spare change, and the last few minutes of every day. If we give him anything at all. We give God the leftovers of our life and then we wonder why our life is lacking in so many ways. We give God the very last of what we've got left over and then we wonder why we lack in so many areas of our life. See, the very part of our life that belongs to God, we should give him first. The very part of our life that belongs to God, it must be given to, it must be given to him first as a seed to allow our faith to grow, to allow provision to happen in our life. But the problem with most of us is, is that we eat our own seed. The problem with most of us is, is that we eat our own seed. And then when harvest time comes, there's nothing left for you to harvest. The title to the message is simply this. The first fruits principle, you're eating your own seed. You're eating your own seed. Many of us, many of us in this place today, many of you, this is the first time you're hearing about the first fruits principle. And that's okay. But then there's many of you in here that have heard it and haven't done anything with it. And then there's some in here that you've heard it and you're applying it to your life. And because you're applying it to your life, you've seen God move in a way that he didn't move before. See, if we will live by the first fruit principle, we will live under an open heaven. Listen to me. I'm not, Pastor, you telling me I'm going to be rich? Nope. I'm not telling you you're going to get a lot of money. What I'm telling you is you'll live under an open heaven. See, when we think about blessings, for some reason, the first thing that always comes to our mind is finances. See, but blessings go beyond money. Blessings go beyond what you have in your pocket. Blessings mean that your household is safe. Blessings mean that your household is well. Blessings mean that your health is good. Blessings mean that nothing is breaking down in your house. Blessings mean that your car lasting longer than what you expected them to. Blessings mean that your children are good, that your children are safe, that your children are protected, that your children are healthy. Blessings go beyond finances. See, I don't believe God gave us biblical principles just for the heck of it. See, I believe God gave us biblical principles because he knows they are in our best interest. He doesn't tell us to forgive just for the heck of it. He understands that if we don't, he didn't say forgive just so the person that hurt you could be justified or so that they could get away with something. He says forgive because he knows if you don't, you'll walk the rest of your life in bondage. And he wants you to be free. See, he gives us biblical principles for a reason. And in the Bible, first fruit. The biblical definition simply means this. A promise to come. That's what first fruits mean. It's a promise to come. In essence, what God was telling the people was this. If you will sow your first fruits, everything that will come after that will be blessed. Blessed. 
It's a promise to come. Say with me, a promise to come. Bear with me, I'm going to go through a few scriptures with you this morning and we're going to talk about the principle from a holistic view. The first scripture we're going to go to today is this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 23. And it says this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits, say first fruits, of those who have fallen asleep. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, say first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. In other words, God was looking for a harvest of people. God was looking for a harvest of people. He was looking for a way for us to be reconciled back to him because we couldn't live by the law and we were not functioning well living by the law. So we had to find a different way to reconcile us in our relationship with him. So guess what he did? He sowed the first fruit. He gave his one and only son as a first fruit for you and I. So in other words, if it had not been for Jesus, you and I would not be sitting here today. Because God gave Jesus as his first fruit, you and I are saved, sanctified, washed by the blood of Jesus, and standing and sitting here today. Because of the first fruit that was given on our behalf. Jesus was given as a first fruit, and guess what? Everything that came after that is blessed. Turn to somebody and say, I'm blessed. See, you and I don't even deserve what we have. How many of you know that some of us made some decisions and some choices in our life to where we should not be living and breathing today? I don't know about you, but I wasn't always saved. I don't know about you, but I didn't always do the right thing. Maybe y'all were holy your whole life, but I wasn't. And I didn't do everything right all the time in my life. But because God gave his son as a first fruit, now I'm holy and righteous and washed by the blood of Jesus and have eternal life. All because of a first fruit offering. God is not asking you to do anything he hadn't done. Mm. First Samuel chapter one, verse 10 and 11. And it says this, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant. How many of you know there's somebody in here thinking that God has forgotten you today? God has not forgotten you today. God has not forgotten you today, baby. God knows who you are. He knows your name. He knows every hair on your head, even if it's fewer than what it used to be. He knows that. God knows who you are. He has not forgotten about you. I don't care if COVID came. I don't care if we're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't care if everything seems to be falling apart in your life. God has not forgotten about you. Say it. God has not forgotten about me. See, Hannah thought God had forgotten about her. And she said, remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. She wanted a son. Hannah was barren and she wasn't supposed to have children. And so she prayed to God and she wanted a son. And she wanted a son, specific. she was specific. She wanted a son and she wanted a son because she wanted him to work in the house of the Lord for his entire life. She wanted him to be in right standing so he could do that. And she wanted, as she said, a hey, son, you know, when we pray, we get greedy sometimes. See, she said, just give me one son. Not you and I. We won't like, we, we go to God and we ask for multiple. We say, God, you believe in multiplication, so I want more. But Hannah said, just give me one. And then, and, and, but notice what she said after that. She said, and then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. 
Understand something, before she ever got her blessing, she was already ready to sow her seed. See, before she got her blessing, she had already made up in her mind that she was giving her first fruit before she ever got the son. Somebody is missing that. See, you've been asking for things. You've been praying for things. You've been saying, God, show me. You've been saying, God, do this. God, do that. And what God is saying today, if you will do your first, before you ever get it, if you'll sow your seed, sow a seed of faith, guess what? He will move on your behalf. Listen to what happened to Hannah. Hannah was barren. She couldn't have kids. So she said, when she prayed, she said, God, I want a son. But before he comes, I'm going to give him right back to you when he gets here. And guess what? As soon as Samuel came. And he was off of his mama's breast. She took him to the house of the Lord and she dedicated him to the Lord. And Samuel worked in the house of the Lord all of his life. But you know what happened to Hannah? Barren Hannah, who couldn't have children after she sold her first fruit, her first child. Guess what? Hannah went on to have five other children. Hannah went on to have five other children. For someone who said she was barren and she couldn't have kids because she gave her first fruit, then everything after that was blessed. They told her she couldn't have kids. She ended up having six kids total. What is it that you've been asking for, that you've been waiting for, that you've been looking for? And all God is saying is if you'll give, if you'll believe this principle, Hannah was blessed because she stood strong and she had the faith to believe that if she gave her first, that God would bless everything afterwards. See, I wonder if you'll have that same faith today. I wonder if you'll have that same faith today. If you are willing to give your first, God is willing to bless everything that comes afterwards. Okay, pastor, so where's the first fruit principle in scripture? Nehemiah. Chapter 10. Verse 35 through 37. And it says this. Verse 35 says, we also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops. Listen to me, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. And of every fruit tree, as it is also written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, of our herds and of our flocks to the house of our God, to the priest ministering there. Verse 37 says this, moreover... We will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of our ground meal or our grain offerings. Listen, they've already said first fruits. Now they're saying offerings and the fruit of all of our trees and our new wine and our olive oil. And we will bring a tithe of our crops to the trees and of our... And, to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. I want you to understand that there's a difference between offerings, first fruits, and tithes. It's not the same thing. They're all different. I want you to understand that it's not the same thing. First fruits and tithes are not the same thing. In scripture, it shows you they're three different things. They brought Offerings, tithes, and first fruits. And where did they bring them to? They brought them to the local church. See, the first sentence of this scripture says this. We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord. Ah, these were people who assumed responsibility. They took ownership of their church. How many people do I have that are willing to take ownership of your church? Listen to me. That was about 10 of y'all. Just in case you were counting. They said, we are willing to assume responsibility for our church. Understand, they had a love for the local church. Because the local church had been good to them. 
The local church was where they were saved. It was where they were taught. It was where they were raised. It was where they were set free. It was where their bondages were broken. It was where they were equipped. It was where they learned life lessons. They loved the local church. How many of you love the local church? And not just when it's convenient for you. When it's not convenient for you. When your person that you're sitting beside is upset with you, how many of you still love the local church? See, because the local church is what God uses to give you life. The local church is what God uses to speak life into you and to encourage you and to raise you up and equip you to go out and do that what you need to do. I learned more life lessons in the local church than I did outside. The life lessons I learned in the local church were the life lessons that allowed me to be successful in business when I was out there. I didn't even have an education yet. And I was being promoted job after job. Every time I turned around, it was promotion happening because I was applying the principles that I learned in the local church in my business, in my life, everywhere I went. See, because understand, when I grew up, it was me and my mom. And my mom taught me everything she could teach me. She couldn't teach me how to be a man. She couldn't teach me everything that I was going to. She couldn't teach me how to be head of household. She couldn't teach me those things. Those were biblical principles that I learned here and applied them to my life. They took ownership of the local church. How many of you know God wants us to take ownership of the local church? How many of you know God wants his house to be blessed just like you want your house to be blessed? How many of you know that when you're going around and you're looking and you say, man, what can I put in my house? How can I bless my house? How can I make my house look beautiful? How can I make my yard look beautiful? How can I put this out there so it will draw people in? How can I make my house look beautiful? God wants you and I to do the same thing with his house. How can I make his house look beautiful? How can I make the yard look beautiful? What can I do to contribute to make this thing beautiful and to draw people in? What is it that I can do? What's my responsibility? They said it's giving you first fruits. Because if we give, if we all give our first fruits, this church will never want for anything. This community will never want for anything. But we got to have some skin in the game. Everybody knows what that is, right? We can go to Deuteronomy. Turn to your neighbor and say, stop eating your own seed. Stop eating your own seed. Deuteronomy 26, start in verse 1. Verse 1 says this, it says, When you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Say when. See, that means that, that, means that they hadn't entered it yet. That means that they had not entered the land that, that, that God was going to allow them to inherit. They had not entered it yet. I got a word for somebody. There's an inheritance that's coming your way. God, there's a new season that's coming your way. I know what you've been through. I know what you've experienced. But there's a new season that's coming your way. I know you've been praying. I know you've been crying yourself to sleep at night. I know you didn't know how it was going to come about. I know you still haven't figured out how it's going to come about. But I'm telling you, there's a new season that's on its way and it's going to be an inheritance from God. It's not going to be because of what you did. It's not going to be because of who you are, but it's going to have everything to do with God. Somebody say my new season is coming. My new season is coming. 
I don't know about you, but I can hear it. I can see it. It's coming. I know you're focused on now, but there's a new season that's coming your way. And you've been praying about it. And God said, baby, it is coming. Hmm. But I need you to know there's going to be a responsibility with that. So it says, when you have entered the land, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it. I mean, you know, you're going to have to take possession of this new season and you're going to have to settle in this new season. But then it says, take the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. That's the local church again. And say to the priest in office at that time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. In other words, before your new season comes, before their new season came, before their inheritance came, he said, look, you need to sow a seed of faith. You need to give your first fruit before you ever see evidence of it. I need you to be prepared to do it. See, because as you give your first fruits, Everything that comes after that is what? Come on. Say, as you give your first fruits, everything that comes after that is what? Okay. You getting it. But verse four says this. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord, your God. But listen to this. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil and oppression. Listen to me. God wants to remind you of something. He wants to remind you of where he brought you from. He wants to remind you of where you were and how much he's done in your life. He wanted to remind you of Egypt and where you've been. And see, sometimes we have to be reminded of what God has done in our life. I don't know about you. I don't have a problem with the first fruit principle because I recognize what God has done in my life and I recognize where he brought me from and I know where I was when he found me and I know that where I am today is only because of that which he's done in my life. See, I don't have a problem with that. That's what God is reminding us of. Where, he, where you were when he found you. And then verse 8 says this. After he reminded them of where they were when he found them. Verse 8 says this. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with great terror and with signs and with wonders. Has God done anything for you? Has God set you free? <laughs> See, giving first, yes, giving first fruits is a, it's, it's, it's about finances. But it's much bigger than that. It's acknowledging who God is in your life and recognizing what he's done for you in your life. I don't know about you, but he has brought me out of Egypt and he brought me out of a place that I should not have been brought out. Some of us should have lost our minds with the things that we experienced in life. Some of us should be dead today. Some of us should not be here. Some of us should not be breathing. Some of us should not be living. Some of us should have lost our mind. But God, but because of God, I'm standing here breathing. I'm standing here with a right mind. And I'm standing here with the power and the authority that God has given me to overcome anything that I'm facing. I'm standing here because of God.
because he brought me out with an outstretched arm and with mighty terror and with signs and wonders. Because anybody that knew me will tell you I should not be in the place that I'm in today. But it's only because of God Almighty operating in my life. And I know some of you, if I go back and ask the people you used to hang around, they would say, she goes, where? To church? She saved? Oh, no, we're not talking about the same Mary Carbajal that I knew. We're not talking about the same Frida that I knew. The Frida that I knew was this, 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 and this. I know she's not saved. The John Pena I knew, Lord, all he did was run the streets. You mean to tell me he's in church? He's preaching? He's a leader in the ministry? He's pouring his life into people? He's making disciples out of people? Verse 9 says this. He brought us to this place and gave us this land. A land flowing with milk and honey. And verse 10 says this. And now. I need somebody to say now. I need somebody to say now. now. <laughs> say, I'm in a now moment. In a now. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given me. And now, not tomorrow, not next year, not next week. And now we are in a now moment. And now I bring the first fruits. Understand something. He said, I bring, I bring the first fruits from the, from the land that you have given me. See, I need to remind you that the only reason you have anything in life is because God gave it to you. I need to remind you, if, <laughs> if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? If it had not been, every day I wake up, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? See, because I recognize that every day that I get up, it's because God gave me the strength to get up. Every day, the only reason you can go to work and excel and do what you do is because God has given you the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, the ability. He's equipped you to go to work and excel in everything that you do. The reason you're a good parent is because God has given you the anointing to be a good parent. The only reason you can be anything that you are is because God has given you the anointing and equipped you to do it. That's the only reason you have what you have. It's, I, know, I know you think you're the best thing since apple pie, baby. I know you think you're the best businessman that's ever been around. But let me tell you, you know why you're so savvy? It's because God gave you that wisdom. God gave you that savviness. He gave you that ability to make decisions. He gave you that ability to make deals. He gave you that ability to be everything that you are. You know, that's one thing I appreciate about Jimmy. About Jimmy Yarbrough. Is that, see Jimmy before he knew Christ, it was all about Jimmy. He would have told you that the reason that he has what he has is because of him. He made it happen. But now, Jimmy recognizes that he shouldn't be here today. <laughs> Jimmy recognizes that he should have been gone a long time ago. Jimmy recognizes that the only reason he has anything, the only reason he walks in blessings is because of the God that lives inside of him. And he's decided to be obedient to what God wants for his life. And he's obedient to it. And that's why he walks in blessings. That dude will walk into blessings and make money and I, he wasn't even trying to. He got more stuff in, in his, on his property that he can sell and make money for. And illegally, legally, it's legal. It's legal, it's not illegal, it's legal. That dude will go and buy something and flip it and sell it for more than what he bought it for and not even trying to. But it's because of the blessings that are on his life. Because he chose to be obedient and he recognizes, he recognizes that that which he has is not because of him. He recognizes that it's because of God Almighty that's in his life. He's blessed. His kids are blessed. His grandkids are blessed. His whole house is blessed because of the decisions that he makes.
verse 11 says this. It starts off and it says, then. So when you see then, that means that whatever comes after then is predicated on what we just said. Understanding that everything you have is because of God. Understanding that you're in your now moment and you're willing to give and sow that first fruit seed. Because of that, then, it says, then you say me. And the Levites, which in biblical terms means the church, say the church. And the foreigners residing among you, that means everybody that you have influence over. So understand, then, because of what you did, because of you decided to give, because of your first fruit seed that you decided to sow, you, the church, and everybody that's around you <laughs> shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and to your household. It's not even about you. It's not even about you. Because of the seed that you sow, not only will you be blessed, not, not only will you rejoice, but the church is going to rejoice and everybody that you influence is going to rejoice because of all the good things that God is doing in your life and your household. But see, when you, when you see the word household in scripture, it means your house. And in biblical terms, your house means not just the people that are living there. It's talking about your lineage. Woo! It's talking about your lineage, baby. So your seed that you sow not only has the ability to bless you, but it blesses you. It blesses your children. It blesses their children. It blesses their children. It blesses their children. It goes down the line. Your house is your lineage. It's not just about you, baby. How many of you want your children to be blessed? The decisions that you make today, the principles that you apply to your life today have the ability to impact your children and impact your lineage when you're gone and you never even met them. <laughs> Do you understand the decisions that Abraham made? His ancestors are still benefiting from that decision over 2,000 years later. The decisions that you make now, the principles you choose to apply to your life now could impact a generation of your house four, four generations from now. And it all happened because of a seed that you sow. Listen to me. I'm going to close with this. Romans eleven sixteen 16 says this. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Understand something. When you sow a seed, and you put a seed in the ground, the plant doesn't grow yet. The first thing to grow is what? The roots. So if your seed is holy, your first fruit seed, if that's holy, then your roots are holy. And if your roots are holy, everything that comes after that is also holy. So that seed you put in the ground because it's holy. If you're on live stream, this principle applies to you. If you're in this sanctuary, this principle applies to you. If you're driving in your car right now, this principle applies to you. See, most people would say, well, this is an Old Testament principle. This was originated in the Old Testament. See, but the last time I checked, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. And the Bible teaches us that every scripture is God breathed and it's inspiration from God. And it allows us, if we apply it to our life, to walk under an open heaven. So it's in your best interest. So today, 
I just want just bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, this day I thank you. I thank you because you are good to us, Lord. You give us word that gives us life. No matter how challenging it is, no matter how much it challenges our faith. Father, if we're obedient to your word, you tell us all the time the blessings follow. We sang this morning that your way is better. So, Father, I pray that we didn't just sing those words just for the heck of it, but that we meant it when we said it and we recognize that your way is better. Father, and today, I pray that, you ch- that this word challenges each and every heart. It challenges us to get out of our comfort zone, and it challenges us that even though it's uncomfortable, it challenges us to be obedient to you. So we bless you and we thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what I want to do. The word of God always requires a response from us.